You're watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs, first century gospel preaching for the 21st century. And welcome to this, another edition of The Ancient Landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs, and I'm so thankful to be with you, and so glad we have this opportunity to once again open up God's Word and to study together. We encourage you to get a Bible out and follow along with the things we're going to study as we spend time in the book of God. We uh, always encourage that, that you'll take your Bible, that you'll follow along. You free to, feel free to take any notes that you'd like to take as well. Certainly, if you want to take those notes and write down the things we're talking about, you're encouraged to do that on the condition that you take those notes that you've, uh, that you've written down, that you study those things out and have found to be true, why well, make sure and do them. Make sure and do and follow what the Lord says. That's what we're about, is just teaching and preaching what the Lord has said, what He has revealed in Scripture. And I know you appreciate that, and I know that's why you've tuned in, and I know you're interested in those things of spiritual nature. And so I'm so glad that you've tuned in and so glad you've invited me into your home that we might study from the book of God for a little while. What I'd like for us to study on is a subject that uh, probably in a lot of areas and probably in a lot of places in life and such, a lot of religious circles, perhaps there are those who will say, well, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't even know why this is a, is a, is a subject uh, for study at all. I don't know why you would talk about it. Uh, it is that ingrained into our society. It is that ingrained into the religious world at large. And that is the subject of instrumental music in worship. Somebody says, well, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean using mechanical instruments in the worship to God. That's what we're talking about. And God is, has been specific about this. And, and this is something that, that does come up from time to time. And it is a subject uh, that, that demands our attention. And it demands our consideration as we think about uh, worshiping God and, and how to do that, how to go about it. I'd suggest to you from the very beginning uh, uh, that God has always told man how to worship him. God did not leave it up to man to decide, well, I'm going to worship in this manner or something else or something else. He has not allowed man to do that. Uh, and I know this from going all the way back to Genesis chapter 4. In Genesis chapter 4, we read about Cain and Abel and how that when Cain and Abel both offered their sacrifices to God, there was one, that is Abel, who was accepted. Cain was rejected. And so we know, now we're not told the specifics of it. The Bible just says in Genesis chapter 4 that in the manner of time, or in the course of time, that these things came about. So Cain and Abel have been offering sacrifices for a while, and then this event came up. And so I know a few things. Even though I do not know the specific statement made by God, I do know that God said he wanted to be worshipped in a certain way. Somebody says, well, how do you even know that? I know that because of God's reaction. God is a just God. He is a fair God. And He is one who does not show partiality. He is one who, uh, like I said, is very fair in how He judges and, and such as that. And so whenever I look back and I see Abel being accepted and Cain being rejected, then I know for a fact those men knew what God had said. God did not just uh, arbitrarily just say one day, okay, I like yours, I hate yours. After perhaps Cain had been doing it acceptably for a while, and now God just says, well, I changed my mind, I don't like what you're doing. That's not God. That's not the way that He is. If you have a situation where one was accepted and one was rejected, that tells me and it tells you that Cain and Abel both knew what God expected, and one refused to do it, and then one did do it. They knew what God expected. And since they knew what God expected, see, it tells me God told them, I want, I want you to worship me in a certain way. You see that as you go on through, uh, well, all the way through the Old Testament, you think about the different sacrifices, especially in the Mosaic Age, and the sacrifices and the keeping of the Sabbath day, keeping the Sabbath day was strictly for the Mosaic time period. That was all. It wasn't beforehand, it wasn't after. But right there in that Mosaic time period, they kept the Sabbath day. They uh, offered sacrifices twice a day there at the, at the tabernacle and then later on at the temple, the door of the temple. 
And they had special feast days offered three times a year. They had those things to do. Besides having uh, just many other offerings and, and various things they would do, and the, the high priest had work to do, and the different priests, they had their work to do, and just on down the list that goes. That didn't come out of the blue. That wasn't something that was invented by man. That was something that came from God. And so also, when you come to the New Testament, when you come to the New Testament, you read John 4, verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We read about that. We read about the specifics of worship, so far as how to worship, and so far as through prayers and the preaching of the gospel, partaking of the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day, giving on the Lord's Day, and yes, the singing of praises to God. We'll read about that in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, Acts chapter 20, and verse 7, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 19, Colossians 3, 16, and other places we're going to discuss concerning singing. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 1 and 2, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 30, and just on and on and on. You go reading about how God expected to be worshipped, and he still expects that today, that we respect what is, is revealed in the New Testament. And so when we think about the instrument of, of music, see, well what about that? Why, uh, why oppose instrumental music? And that's where I'm coming from on this. To have an instrument in the worship to God. And please don't get this confused, by the way. There's some folks that say, well, that, that if you take a position that God's opposed to instrumental music, that means that you're just opposed to instrumental music, you know, across the board. That you just think it's a sin, it's wrong in any context, at any time, in any manner, you can't have an instrument. That is wrong. That's not what I'm saying. That is not what I'm advocating. There are times where an instrument of music is, is right and authorized and just fine to do. That someone might, might want to have a, uh, you know, just a family get together and sit down and pick and grin for a while. Well, that's a fine thing to do. There's no sin in that. Someone may want to go to a concert and maybe it's a great, con you know, concert pianist and they want to hear that wonderful person just go and just play that piano and just tickle those ivories all evening long. Well, if you want to do that, that is no sin. That is fine. That is not condemned by God. But where the problem comes in is when folks try to integrate and try to uh, add that into the worship. See? So let's be specific about it. I'm talking about in the worship. And yes, today you'll have folks who have uh, quote-unquote praise teams and, and bands and, and all kinds of things. Uh, there uh, that is added to the worship. And that's what I'm talking about. That's what the Bible is talking about. And so we're going to discuss that together, is that instrumental music in the worship to God Almighty. What has God said? Why be opposed to it? Why, why stand out and say, I don't want to do that, and, and it shouldn't be done? Not merely that I don't wish for it, but that it shouldn't be done, that it is a wrong thing. Why do that? Why oppose that? Well, let me start by saying this. The reason why we're talking about op opposing instrumental music is not because it's just an arbitrary decision. Okay? It's not just because someone just decided one day, ah, I just don't want to have instruments anymore. It wasn't an arbitrary decision that was made that just out of the blue, just on a whim, just some personal wish or personal thought just said, I don't want to, let's just sing. That's not the reason why. Another reason that we could talk about is just to be contrary. You know what? And some people are like this, aren't they? If you sit up, they'd say down. If you said black, they'd say white. You know, and if you talk about it being sunny outside, they'd say, well, it looks like the biggest rainstorm I've ever seen. Just to be contrary. Now, I agree there are people like that, but that's not, that's not the reason why. Somebody says, well, uh, it's because you can't afford them. And I remember one man in particular saying that. He said he visited with a, with a congregation, uh, with the Lord's people, a church of Christ in a certain area. And he walked in the door and he looked around and there was no piano, no drums, no guitars, no anything like that. And, and he said in his mind, he just thought, these poor people, they can't even afford a piano. See that? You know, it's not because we can't afford them. And I tell you this, and I make this promise, if you can prove from the New Testament Scriptures that God wants man to sing and use an instrument, a mechanical instrument, 
in the worship. And you can prove that by the Bible, that God expects and demands and commands a, a mechanical instrument in the worship. Then we'll go buy one. It's not a matter we can't afford it. It's a matter of whether or not it's even right in the first place. Because if God says to do something and He expects it to be done, then we'll just go get it. We'll, we'll do it if we have to you know, borrow money or whatever we have to do. We'll get it if that's what we need to do. And that's a promise. So it's not a matter of saying we can't afford something. Or historical tradition sometimes plays a part. And you'll hear this, well, it's just not been in our history. It's not been in our, uh, you know, our, our way of, of doing things, our tradition to uh, have an instrument. Since it's not been our tradition to have an instrument, we just won't do that and we just won't start that. Well, no. Now, we recognize the fact that there are traditions from God. The book of Thessalonians speaks about that and how there are traditions that come from God. There are also traditions that come from man. And so if this is a man-made tradition we're talking about, if that's what that is, then let's abandon that man-made tradition and let's go and find out what God has to say. That's the truth. Let's find out what the Bible teaches, what the Bible has revealed. Let's do that. Somebody says, well, you just want to be different. You know, and, and you look around today and you see, uh, you know, folks, uh, you know, using instruments and so forth. And so in that desire to be different, you just want to be different and do something else. No, listen, if that were the case, if it's just a matter of saying uh, we want to be different, if that was the case, we just wouldn't sing at all. See, now that would be different. What would you think if you came into a, a, an assembly, came into a congregation and sat down and they had prayers and preaching and such and all that and then and after a while then they just went home and no one ever sung a song? What would you think about that? Now see, that would be different. See, if you're going to desire to be different, then that would be the way to go. Not just say, well, we don't have an uh, instrument here. See, but those are not the reasons why. That's not it at all. In fact, we're going to show in just a moment the biblical reasons why. But one thing I think is interesting, and I know I'm spending some time on this, but I want to get this set. I want, I want us to lay this foundation and be solid on what we're... and then that, that way we'll build from there. But you know there are folks who oppose instrumental music down through the years. Sometimes you have people might have the attitude that, well, uh, it's always been this way. It's always been instruments of music. It's always been that kind of thing. And, and this idea of just singing or singing alone or singing only, well, that's just something that the Church of Christ came up with and it's just not, you know, it's just not so or whatever. It's just what they want to do. It's not really a Bible thing at all. Some people may have that kind of an attitude. But I want you to think about this. Uh, I want to give you some quotes from, from some very famous men. And I want to see what you think about them. When, we, when I read these, I recognize those are not our authority today, but I'm using those, these for a, a historical context, that we might get the historical side of things. For example, uh, one man said this about instruments of music. He said, I have no objection to instruments of music in our chapels, provided they're neither heard nor seen. How's that? He said, I have no objection, provided you can't hear them and you can't see them. Now, who said that? Who made that famous quote? Do you know John Wesley made that quote? John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, made that quote and he said, it's fine if they're in our chapels, just provide you don't hear them or see them. Think about that. The Methodist. Here's another one. He says that the organ in the worship is an ensign of Baal. And that word ensign means an emblem, a token. It means it reminds you of Baal. The organ in the worship is that emblem of Baal. You know who said that? That was Martin Luther. Martin Luther, of course, famous for nailing his 98 theses to the, to the door of the Catholic uh, chapel there, you remember. But also, he was, uh, became uh, the founder of the Lutheran Church. Even though he told his own people, don't call yourselves Lutherans, they did it anyways. But uh, he is known for that. And so the Lutherans. And so he says to have instrumental music was uh, an emblem of Baal. Isn't that something? 
How about this one? Uh, he says, musical instruments and celebrating the praises of God will be no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting of lamps, and, other, and the restoration of other shadows of the law. Think about that. What he's doing is going back to the Old Testament. He says, if you try to bring back instrument of music, you might as well bring back the lighting of incense, the burning of candles, and the restoration of other things of the law. Might as well bring them all back too because you, you got one piece from the Old Testament. Might as well bring the rest of it with you. You know who said that? John Calvin. John Calvin. You ever heard these names before? I imagine you have. Here's another one. I just as soon pray to God with machinery as to sing to God with machinery. You know who said that? Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon was one of the most well-known Baptist preachers of the late 1800s and early 1900s. He preached over in, in England, in London, England, and pre this was... This was the, the mega church of the day because every Sunday he preached to well over a thousand people there in, in London. And so well over a thousand uh, there in attendance would come and that's what he told them. And he said that in his commentaries and he wrote about it different times and said, I just soon pray to God with machinery as to sing to God with machinery. And you know, so long as he was there in London, so long as he was there uh, preaching in those days, you know, in that Baptist church, they never had an instrument of music. They never had one. And another very interesting uh, thought was this. One man said, our church does not use mechanical instruments. Our church doesn't use them. You know who that was? Thomas Aquinas. He was a Catholic. The Catholic scholar back in about the 13th century said, our church doesn't use them. And so if we walk down through here, we've seen folks associated with the Catholics, with the Baptists, with the Methodist, see, other uh, denominational movements and such. Of course, John Calvin associated with Calvinism, that very um, foundational doctrine of so much, so much false doctrine today, and he was the founder of all that, and there he was. What do you think uh, folks would think of their babies today? What do you think they would think now as they look back and see their babies in action? and see how far they have gone. Not how far they've come, how far they have gone. See, back a long time ago, before we had so many uh, you know, books and references and such like that, whenever all people had to study for their Bible study was a Bible and a lexicon or something like that. Back in those days, before they had so many uh, you know, thoughts, thoughts of men to, to uh, go and to ascribe to or go to consider and read after. For they had that, all those folks had was a Bible and had a lexicon or something like that to kind of help them out. And whenever they did that, everybody could come to the same conclusion because all they were doing was reading out of the Bible. See that? I'm not saying they didn't have other false doctrines that they had to work through, but I'm saying, don't you find it fascinating? I do. I find it fascinating that though these men that I mentioned are separated by centuries and separated by, time, uh, by, by space and by... Uh, some of them were in America, some of them were in England, some of them in other parts of the world and all, and yet they're all saying the same thing? How is that possible? How could that be? It's because they're going... And, and just reading what the Bible says concerning singing in worship. That's what it's about. And so, what does the New Testament say about singing? What does the Bible tell us? Whenever you're reading in the New Testament, what do you find concerning these things? Well, look over to Matthew chapter 26, for example. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 30. He says, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. See, when they sung, they sung a hymn. Mark 14, verse 26 says the same thing. You writing these down? I hope you will, because there's no less than 10 New Testament passages that speak about folks singing. Acts 16, verse 25 says at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And so once more, there they were singing, weren't they? You find this not only mentioned in, in the book of Acts 16, at Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15 and verse number 9, he says that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles 
and sing unto thy name. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. And by the way, 1 Corinthians 14, 15 was the passage that Charles Spurgeon was commenting on. Because in that passage he says, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, I will sing with the understanding also. Singing with spirit and understanding. Kind of, kind of sounds to me like John 4, 24, doesn't it to you? Worship God in spirit and in truth. And he says, sing in spirit and in understanding. See, 1 Corinthians 15, um, yes, 14, verse 15. Furthermore, while we're reading together, look in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. In Ephesians 5, in the verse number 19, notice what he says here. He says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Notice that, singing, making melody in your heart or with your heart to the Lord. Again, Colossians 3, verse 16. In Colossians 3, verse 16, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And we just see these passages over and over. Are you writing these down? I hope you are. But we're going to talk about them again, I promise. So if you're missing some, we'll come back to them, I promise. But just notice we've gone from Matthew and Mark and Acts and Romans and Corinthians now, 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, Colossians, and you just keep on walking through the Bible. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 12. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 12, notice what he says. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing thy praise. And so again, here is a reference to what singing praises to the God of heaven. Over and over again, it's sing, singing, sung, sang. You just see this on and on and on. In Hebrews, the Bible talks about chapter 13 and verse number 15. Hebrews 13 verse 15. Notice what he says there. By him therefore, he says, By him therefore let us offer up the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks unto his name. And so here it is, the fruit of our lips. Somebody says, well, that doesn't say sing. No, it doesn't. But it says fruit of our lips. Now, how do you sing? Say, how do you sing? You're going to use your mouth, aren't you? You can sing and, and offer, offer that praise to God through singing, just as much as through prayer, just as much as through just oral speech, just, just speaking to somebody. You can do it that way. I recognize that. But you must admit, and you have to admit, that fruit of our lips includes singing. And that's what that's about. John James chapter 5 and verse 13. In James chapter 5 and verse number 13, he says, There is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any among you merry, let him sing psalms. And again, you notice here, where he's saying to sing once more. Just over and over, no less than ten times in the New Testament, it's sing, sing, sing singing, sang, sung, uh, it's just over and over again. Now that word sing, my friends, is a specific word. You can't say sing, and by say singing, then imply that you're also playing an instrument. You can't do both, see, because that's a different type of music. You can have singing, which is a cappella. A cappella, and by the way, the word a cappella, you've probably heard that before. The word a cappella means of the church. You do know that, don't you? And so way back yonder, then that, that whenever that Latin word was used, and they used the word a cappella, it, it reminded them, in other words, those who first coined the phrase, for ones who first invented that word, whenever someone just sang, it reminded them of what went on in worship. And so a cappella, see, of the church, or of the chapel, or of the church, see, that's where that came from. That's the origination of that word. And so, uh, a cappella, see, just singing. There's such a thing as vocal music. There is such a thing as instrumental music. And you can have instrumental music and no one ever says a word. You know what? And a lot of times those uh, are heard on, on the radio and, and different, different genres of music might have that. Like I said, you might go to... A, a piano a recital, and it may be some wonderful pianist from, from somewhere, very famous, 
and they might be on the stage and they may play their songs and that's the point they may play the song uh, you know 10 20 songs in a row and never utter a word you know what that's called instrumental music and then there's some that might sing and that's of course vocal music now I recognize I do understand that there are times in our culture, in our society, obviously, where we, where we join the two. And you might have someone up being the singer, the lead singer in a band, and everyone else in the band is playing and the lead singer is singing. I recognize there are times when those things are, are melded together and blended together. I recognize that. That's obvious. But whenever you come to Scripture in the Bible, you do not find that joining together, that blending of two things. You just find folks singing. Over and over again, that command, sing, 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 all the way through. Okay? And that's what we're seeing. So as we've laid this foundation now, we want to go ahead and, and take a break here for a moment. We're going to come back and we're going to talk, about, talk more about this in detail and get down to some of the nitty-gritty about singing and what it is and what it means and the reason we need to be singing when we worship God. I'm so thankful that you're, you're here, you stay tuned, and on the other side of this break, we'll come back and continue in our Bible study. So you stay tuned, and we'll be right back. You're watching The Ancient Landmark. We invite you to visit with the Caneyville Church of Christ, meeting at 101 North Main Street in Caneyville, Kentucky. Visit our website at www.caneyvillechurchofchrist.com Sunday morning Bible classes for all ages begin at 10 a.m. Sunday worship services begin at 10.45 a.m. and 5 p.m. Wednesday night Bible classes for all ages begin at 7 p.m. And tune into our radio program, The Ancient Landmark, Monday through Friday from 1 to 1.30 p.m. on 99.9 .9 FM WXMZ. Or listen live on the internet at www.vz.voicetech.com. Write to The Ancient Landmark, care of Jared Jacobs. 5695 Caneyville Road, Morgantown, Kentucky, 42261. For a free Bible correspondence course and a free subscription to the Old Pass, our teaching bulletin, the Ancient Landmark airs on Monday at 9 p.m. Tuesday at 1.30 p.m., Wednesday at 5 p.m., Thursday at 11 p.m., and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Our question at this time concerns another objection that has been made to Bible baptism and specifically saying, well, really, I believe in being saved by grace through faith. And if you're saved by grace through faith, then that necessarily excludes baptism. And that is a common thing that is heard by many people. They'll try to say, well, the Bible speaks about being saved by grace through faith, and since, it's, since it didn't say grace, faith, baptism, well, then I guess in baptism not necessary. Well, let's talk about that. First of all, let's look over the book of Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, that's where that phrase is found. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning verse 8, he says, Therefore by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, he says, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, he says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now that's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. And yes, that Bible says, this, your Bible says the same thing, that we are saved by grace through faith. And, but does, say, be, does being saved by grace through faith exclude baptism from the chart? That's the question. And I want to show you from the Bible that that is not the case. Remember, as you look in the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians is written to the church, to the Christians, at Ephesus. 
And we have a very unique situation with the book of Ephesians and the fact that we not only read this book written to them, not only do we read about Jesus' words to them in Revelation chapter 2, but in fact we read about their beginnings in uh, the Bible as well in the book of Acts. And so we're going to look at Acts chapter 19 and read about them uh, here just momentarily. But I remind you also from the book of Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, and the verse is number 13, he talks about that, about the fact that in Him, in Christ, he says, He also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, believed in Him, and He said you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so, right here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, he says, you heard of him, didn't you? Well, whenever they heard uh, in, uh, they heard him, that produced the faith, didn't it? Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So they heard God's word. They believed on him. And that's also said in Ephesians chapter 2, by grace you are saved through faith. There is faith. So they heard God's word. It produced that faith. But was it faith alone or faith only? Well, let's go to Ephesians chapter, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 tells us about the conversion of these first people at Ephesus, these first Christians. And the Bible says that Paul had gone into that city. And he was preaching the truth. Again, Acts 1, I'm sorry, Ephesians 1 verse 13, in whom you heard, you know. And so they're hearing about Christ and, and he begins to speak to them about the Holy Spirit. And did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they said, we, didn't, we don't even know what the Holy Spirit is. And so he said, well, into what were you baptized? They said, unto John's baptism. So Acts 19, verse 4, Paul said, John baptized. He says, baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe on him uh, who shall come after him. That is Jesus. In other words, what John was preaching was, um, of course, good for that time, but John was preaching that Christ was yet to come. And he said, that's not the case at all. Christ, of course, has come and gone. He's died and buried and rose, and, and he's ascended back to his Father. So he tells him about this. And so upon hearing this, Acts 19.5, the Bible says they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so here were folks who heard God's word. They believed on it. And then he took them and baptized them. You see that? They heard it. They believed it. We know they believed it. And Ephesians 2 and verse 8 says they did. And we know that because hearing God's word produces faith, Romans 10, 17, and they heard the word. So from hearing, believing, were baptized. See, that's what happened in Acts 19 at the conversion. Now later on, sometime later then, Paul writes them a letter, and in writing that letter says, By grace are you saved through faith. See that? Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. But folks, it goes together. Being saved by grace through faith does not exclude baptism. Being saved by grace through faith includes baptism. And you don't have to go any farther than Acts 19 and see those folks heard God's word and they believed it. They were baptized, Acts 19.5. They were baptized into Christ. And then Paul writes them a letter. And when he writes them, he says, by grace are you saved through faith. That's the truth. And so away with this idea that says that somehow that if you're saved by grace through faith, it excludes baptism, or baptism is not necessary. Far from it. In fact, it includes it. It's a part of it. See, that faith certainly is an inclusive thing, and it includes baptism. Uh, otherwise, you have the Bible contradicting itself. We know the Bible doesn't contradict. The Bible is in harmony with itself. And so when we read about the things that the Ephesians did... Then, uh, through that, hearing God's word, and they believed it, Ephesians 1, 13, and they obeyed it, they were baptized, and then Paul could write them a letter saying, by grace you're saved through faith. And so the question is, have you been saved by grace through faith? If you have been saved by grace, grace through faith, that means you're baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. And welcome back, and we want to continue in our study of the book of God. We've been talking about instrumental music in the worship, and talking about how that that is not allowed by God. That is not something that uh, we're supposed to be doing, really. When you look into Scripture in the New Testament, you find continued emphasis upon singing praises to God. Whether you're talking about when Jesus and his apostles sang there after, after having partaken of the Lord's Supper, 
whether you're talking about the singing that was done in, uh, with, with the apostles, Paul and Silas, and whether you're talking about other occasions like this, whether you're talking about the teachings that was actually written down for the Corinthians, the Ephesians, the Colossians, the uh, Hebrew Christians and so forth, uh, the James and him writing to the strangers scattered abroad, those Christians scattered all over, or who, regardless of who you're talking about, you're going to see continued emphasis upon that singing, sing, sang, sung, singing all, all the way through. And that's what we find. Whenever God has been specific about something, it excludes everything else in that category. And I think that's a big point that we miss a lot of times in our Bible study and in determining what is truth. And, you know, whenever someone has been, uh, whenever God has specified a thing, then that is it. You can go back in Old Testament days, whenever God told Noah to build an ark of gopher wood. God was very, very specific in that in Genesis 6 and verse 14. He was specific in, in declaring that you need to build an ark, all right? Well, ark, A-R-K, that ark is a specific type of vessel. The, the ark was basically a great big box. And it was a big box, big enough, big old cargo hold, cargo box here, big enough to hold the animals and to hold uh, men and all of that, that, that would be in there that would be saved from that flood. Now, in so doing... God was specific, see. It wasn't that Noah was going to go out and, and build a bunch of Johnny boats. He wasn't going to go and build a battleship. He wasn't going to build a luxury liner, a yacht, or anything like that. He wasn't going, going to build a fishing boat. It was a great big box is what it amounted to. And it was three stories tall and, and all of that. It was just an amazing thing to be built. But God was specific. Furthermore, he was specific when he said build an ark of gopher wood. Now, what old gopher wood is, I don't know. But I do know Noah knew. And that when Noah did that, God was specific in saying gopher wood. He wasn't going to build it out of oak, or wasn't going to build it out of sassafras, or hickory, or, or a beech tree, or whatever else you might think of. He wasn't going to use a palm tree. He wasn't going to use, you know, balsa wood, and just down the list. That wasn't what he's was going to have. You're going to build this out of gopher wood. That was specific. And so when God was that specific, he didn't have to say, and don't, 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 because it was understood whenever God said, use gopher wood, uh, that excluded every kind of, of other tree or other kind of wood that you might want to use. When he said, build an ark out of it, then that excluded every, that excluded every other kind of sailing vessel. Now, when you go on in Scripture and we read about how that God said that when, when you make the offering, there the Passover lamb was to be that. It could be a lamb. It could be a goat, he said. But you're going to take this lamb as a one-year-old lamb. And he says, without spot, blemish, or anything like that, you're going to offer that. Well, whenever he said that, and he did make allowances for a goat, I recognize that. But whenever he said a sheep, then that excluded a cow, didn't it? He said, I want this one-year-old. Well, that excluded every other year. He couldn't get the little baby that was less than a year old. He couldn't get a 10-year-old lamb. He couldn't get a, you know, an, an old worn-out lamb that was just going to die anyways. No, he wanted you to pick uh, that one-year-old the best. And uh, again, it was a lamb. It wasn't going to be a, a, you know, a duck. It wasn't going to be you know, a thousand other things, a thousand other combinations you could put in there. They wasn't going to be it. It wasn't going to be a wolf in sheep's clothing either. See, he's going to have a lamb. And whenever he talked about um, there the high priest and how the high priest was going to be from the or the, all the priests really, but they included the high priest being from the tree, tribe of Levi. When they came from the tribe of Levi, see, then that excluded every other tribe. And even in the book of Hebrews chapter seven, uh, it makes this point. It's in verse fourteen, how that it's evident our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Well, right there tells you something about it, because when the tribe of Levi was specifically named, it excluded every other tribe as being acceptable. And that was one of the problems you get into when you get into Rehoboam and his error and his wrongdoing there in 1 Kings chapter 12. He took men from other tribes to become priests, and that was, that was wrong, that was sin, because God had been specific, hadn't he? And he didn't have to go through 
and say, okay, it's from the tribe of Levi, it's going to be the priesthood. And not Reuben, and not Simeon, and not Asher, and not Naphtali, and not Zebulun, and not... He didn't have to do that. Just like he got, whenever God said, make an ark of gopher wood, he didn't have to say, and not hickory, and not sassafras, and not a palm tree, and not balsa wood, and not this, and not, 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 not. He didn't have to go down the list like that. Not a magnolia tree. He didn't have to say that. And so, when you look into the New Testament, that same principle is still true. Whenever you're reading about sing, 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 sing all the time, he doesn't have to say, okay, I want you to sing, and don't use an itch, and don't use a piano, don't use a guitar, don't use drums, and don't use this, and don't use something else, da 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 down the list. He doesn't have to do that. Because once he said sing, that was specific, and once he said sing, it specified the, the vocal music, vocal singing, and excluded every other type of music that you could talk about. Okay, you're going to sing. And he didn't have to say, okay, and don't do that mumbling with your lips and don't don't you do like some guys do where they, they do something in, you know, they make sounds out of their mouth that sound like musical instruments. He didn't say, and don't, 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 don't. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to say, okay, now I don't want you to use a comb, you know, and a, you know, comb and a piece of paper and make that little humming sound. I don't want you to do that. He didn't have to say all the possible uh, combinations all the possibilities that might ever be when it came to a mechanical instrument, what he had to say was, sing. And when he said that, it was done. And I need to respect that. We all need to respect that. On this subject and every other subject, really. Every other subject, God has been specific about something. It excludes everything else. See, You can also see this in the case of the Lord's Supper. God was specific. When he talks about in the Lord's Supper, instituting the Lord's Supper with the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. Unleavened bread and that grape juice. And that's it. And he didn't have to say, all right, now I want this, but I don't, and, and I recognize that we're here celebrating. That's when Jesus started in Matthew 26. He didn't have to say, I recognize we're celebrating the Passover right now, but I've stopped that. So, you know, guys, don't make lamb burgers out of this. He didn't have to say that. Everybody understood, when you take this unleavened bread, and he says, this is my body, and then he takes that fruit of the vine, and he says, this is my blood, all right? And he says, these things are symbolic of, of that fact. It's not that they turned into anything. It's just that that bread is symbolic of his body, and the fruit of the vine is symbolic of his blood that was shed. And so those were, were visible, tangible reminders of what Christ has done, but he didn't have to go through the, the whole gamut, did he? He was specific. Here's the bread and here's the fruit of the vine. And so we, we understand that. And you see that again in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 30. You see this in the book of Matthew, Mark, in the book of Luke as well. Mark chapter 14, Luke chapter 22. You just see this again and again. And then you see folks in the book of Acts partaking of the Lord's Supper in Acts 20, two, chapter 2 and verse 42. And then Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 and other places. And here they are, uh, certainly worshiping, and they're certainly part of it. But they, again, God didn't have to say, or Christ didn't have to say, okay, it's bread and it's fruit of the vine. Now, no Twinkies, all right? No birthday cake, uh, no hamburgers, uh, no, uh, you know, no steaks, no lamb burgers. I mean, go down the list. He didn't have to say all that. Now, I don't want you drinking water. I don't want you drinking milk. I don't want you drinking, uh, you know, I want you drinking red eye. I don't want you, you know, he didn't have to say all the things don't drink. Don't drink orange juice. He didn't have to say all that, did he? Because once he's been specific, then excluded everything else in the category. And so it is here. Whenever God's been specific about singing, it excludes everything else in that category. And that's what you're seeing over and over again. Matthew 26 and verse 30. If you missed some of these, I'll give the list to you again. Matthew 26 and verse 30. Mark 14 verse 26. Acts chapter 16 verse 25. Romans 15 and verse 9. First Corinthians 14 verse 15. Ephesians 5 19. Colossians 3 16. Hebrews 2 verse 12. Hebrews 13 verse 15. And in James 5 and verse 13, 10 passages, 10 places, talking about singing there in the New Testament. That's what you find here. Sometimes you have people uh, upset about that and they want to argue about it. Say, well, you know, of course uh, they didn't have uh, instrumental music in the jail. 
you know, uh, that wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't have had that in Acts 16, verse 25. Oh, of course they didn't have that. Well, no, that's right. They didn't whip out banjos and start start playing. They didn't have guitars and all that. But, folks, the point was they were able to worship God right there in the in the prison cell and could do so without saying, "Well, I guess we got to wait till we get a banjo." You know, I guess we got to have we'll have to wait till we get a trumpet. I guess we're gonna have to wait till we get a drum set. No. They could worship God right then, right there, because they were doing it the way God intended. They were doing it the way God had described. And so whether you were in prison, a prison cell, free, whether you're in, uh, well, like meeting in a church building type situation like Corinthians was. He said they were gathered together into one place. Wherever those places were, see, then they were able to sing, they were able to do, obey, or follow God's command. Isn't that amazing? Every aspect of worship, whether you're talking about singing, preaching, the prayers, taking the Lord's Supper, the giving, any aspect of that can be done on the Lord's Day anywhere in the world. Anywhere. I mean, uh, somebody says, well, you know what, grape juice might be hard. Do you know you can grow grape, ju grape juice on every continent in the world except Antarctica, I suppose? At least that's what I've been told. Grapes grow on every continent except Antarctica. In other words, anywhere where people are, you can grow grapes. And there's your grape juice. You, anywhere you can have unleavened bread, that's easy. There's leaven without the, I'm sorry, bread without the leaven in it. Leavening agent. Yeah, you can have that pretty easy. Flour, water, bang. That's pretty easy to get in it. And then you talk about uh, singing. You can sing. You're already equipped with the ability to sing. Somebody says, I can't sing. No, wait a minute. He didn't say sing good. He said sing. <laughs> See? And so everyone is equipped with the ability to sing. You already have that built in, don't you? And then you talk about prayers and preaching. God's worship, while sublime, while God's worship is far-reaching and it's very uh, deep in so many ways, it is also very simple. And it is something that where you can worship God on a boat, you could worship God in a house, you could worship God in a, at a brush arbor, you could worship God in a building somewhere, you could worship God outside, inside, upside down. You can do that, see. And here it is with singing as well. You can sing praises to God. It can be done. And that's the way God made it. Somebody says, well, I think back in, the, in this Bible, though, there's the word solo, where it says psalms and hymns and spiritual songs uh, in the book of Ephesians 5, verse 19, Colossians 3, 16, and they said there's that word solo there, P-S-A-L-L-O. They said that's the original word, and the word solo means to pluck on a string, and so to pluck and, and such as that. So that's what that means, and so really you have to have something to pluck on, and so that's where a guitar comes in and a banjo and stuff like that. Well, you got to have something to pluck on. Well, all right, well, here's the thing. And that's, I mean, that word solo means that. But there's such a thing as a context as well. And so in the context, whenever he says solo, he also tells the instrument. As you read Ephesians 5.19, he says to uh, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody with your heart to the Lord. The instrument upon which you play, the instrument upon which one is plucking, if you will, is the heart of man. That's what Ephesians 5.19 shows. Colossians 3.16, singing with grace in your heart, grace with your heart to the Lord. And so there once more, the instrument upon which one is playing is the heart of man. See, not that. I mean, and, and there again, we're going to have issues as well because if you want to get specific on that and you're going to insist, no, nope, that solo means you have to have an instrument. If that's true, then you better get rid of your drum set. You better get rid of your trumpets. You better get rid of anything, uh, triangles, bells. Uh, I mean, go down the list. Anything that doesn't have a string to pluck on, see, Got to get rid of them. Somebody says, well, I think that's going a little too far. Well, I think that one was going too far when you're trying to get a guitar 
out and get an instrument of any kind out of verses that say to sing. See? So I can illustrate absurdity by being absurd just like you can, see. I'll just show you where this thing leads because if that's the case and that's so, then, then the instrument must be something that's a stringed instrument that you pluck on. Bye-bye piano. So you don't pluck on a piano string. There's a hammer that hits the string. If you're going to pluck on it, see, pluck on it like a carpenter, uh, you know, a carpenter's chalk line, you know, you pluck on it like that. That's the idea. And so if you're going to do that, and you're going to, you know, run that direction, then be prepared for those consequences. See, I want to suggest to you that the point was, in the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, that that which is, is used is the heart of man. The heart of man. This is the Bible heart, by the way. The heart of man is engaged that, and, and hold your finger right there and jump back over to John 4, 24. That's why you say, worship God in spirit and in truth. Because when you worship God in spirit and in truth, it involves the heart of man. That's what that's about. Singing is something everyone can do. Not everybody can play an instrument. Some folks try and they still can't do it. Not everybody can play an instrument. But everybody can sing. Everyone has the ability, the mechanical ability, vocal cords and all that kind of thing. And you can do that. See that? And so it is possible. God has created us with that. We've all got that heart. We've got that mental capacity. We can sing to the Lord in spirit and in truth. That's the truth. See? And so, away with this idea of people trying to justify uh, instruments and music and all this and, and just grasping at straws, really. Because then again, I remind you of a third thing. That remember, God is no respecter of persons. So says Acts chapter 10 and verse 33 and 34. The Bible says God is no respecter of persons in the book of Ephesians as well in chapter 6. Because that's the case. What he tells you to do, he tells me to do. And what he tells me to do, he tells you to do. And so whenever he says sing, that's what he wants done is for us to sing. If we uh, have someone justify it saying, well, uh, you need to have an instrument also. You need to sing and you have to have an instrument too. If that's the case, then better everybody have an instrument. Better everybody have one because what God has told me to do, he's told you to do. See. It's not good enough to have eight Myrtle up here uh, playing on the organ and everybody else out there singing. See that? Because if it's eight Myrtle up there playing on the playing on the piano, playing over organ or whatever, and she's doing it, she's the only one right in the building because she's the one that's singing and playing at the same time. She's the only one correct, and everyone else is wrong because what God told us to do, He told us all to do. He didn't say one person do this and someone else do this. And uh, like a, some type of a show when it comes to singing. The singing is never uh, described as, as anything except that congregational singing. See? And we need to remember that. Well, let's just go on with our study then. You say, well, what's the purpose then? What, what is the purpose of singing? Do you realize singing has a purpose? First of all, singing's purpose is this. Singing's purpose is it shows obedience to the Lord's command. That's James 5.13. Anyone you afflicted, let him praise, and he marry, let him sing songs. It shows obedience to God. So that's a biggie right there. The purpose of singing number two is it follows the example of Christ. Remember what happened after they had sung a hymn? See, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So they sung a hymn. There's an example from Jesus. Matthew 26, 30, Mark 14, 26. It also follows the example of the apostles. Remember Acts 16, 25? There, even though they were in dire circumstances and they'd been beaten and harmed and, and hurt so bad, Paul the Apostle and Silas there was with him, and yet they still sang praises to God. And they prayed to God. The prisoners heard them. I'll tell you something else that singing does. Singing praises to God also fulfills Old Testament prophecy. I find it fascinating that uh, there are many Old Testament verses that talk about singing and also talk about playing an instrument. The Bible does speak of that in the Old Testament. But remember, back in the Old Testament days, that was a command from God to do so. It says so in the book of Psalms, Psalm, and, and, uh, Psalms and in Chronicles, that this was a command of God to be done. 
And so that changed over with the New Testament, and the New Testament changed over. And so that's why we have all these new things. And it's not like it was before. It's not the same law. It's not the same covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 says so. It's not the same covenant. It's not the same thing. And so you go back in Old Testament days, and they had that. But I find it fascinating that of all the possible passages, out of all the scripture you could possibly use on, the, on this subject, when you go to Romans 15, verse 9, and Hebrews 2 and verse 12, they specifically quote psalms that speak only of singing. See, that's not a coincidence. Romans 15, verse 9 quotes Psalm 18, verse 49. And Hebrews 2, verse 12 quotes Psalm 22, verse 22. Look those up and you'll see this. But of all the possible psalms you could quote and all the possible references you could, you could go to, those two verses go to the two Old Testament verses that say just to sing. Isn't that something? And then, you look in Ephesians 5 verse 19, singing exhorts and encourages one another. And exhorts, encourages, helps one another. We do that. Colossians 3 16, we teach one another. Where remember where he said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, Colossians 3.16. And so there's that, uh, what's more, encouraging one another, helping one another in those very ways. And so, what do we see here? We just find over and over those very uh, truths. And singing to God, by the way, is a spiritual sacrifice. Remember, by Him therefore let us offer up the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. So there, it's, and another thing that's very interesting, if you paid attention, we've had ten Bible verses, ten New Testament passages telling us to sing. We have then had ten passages, those same ten, showing us the purpose of singing. And folks, it's a spiritual sacrifice. It's a spiritual sacrifice that is offered up. So why oppose instrumental music? I think I can show you those things. And, and you can see just why. It's not in accordance to Scripture. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, See that you make all things according to the pattern. And it, the, to talk about uh, instruments and, the mu and instrumental music in the worship is not according to the pattern. It's not according to the New Testament pattern. Furthermore, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, he says there that uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Whenever you do something uh, such as add instruments of music into the worship, you're acting and doing something that is not by faith. It's not by faith because you did not hear Jesus on the subject. You didn't listen to Him because if you listen to Him, you've just been singing. That's the truth. See that? And thus what it ends up being is instrumental music becomes vain worship. Matthew 15, 8 and 9 talks about that. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. And yes, my friends, that becomes vain worship. Whenever you decide to add instruments of music into the worship. And so let's stay away from that. Let's not have any part of that. If you're belonging to a church and, and they're with a church that has, has uh, added instruments and music and such, Talk to the preacher about that. Ask questions. That's why are we doing this when there's no less than 10 New Testament passages that say to sing only. Ask them why. And don't take no for an answer. Don't, don't just be uh, you know, sloughed off and say, ah, that's not for you to worry about. We're, you know, we'll take care of you. No. Ask the questions and see just what the truth really is. If I can help in any way, I want to help you. Contact me. And let's talk about these things. Let's talk about the truth and learn what God would have us to learn, and worship in a way that is in spirit and in truth, that is not vain, but is fruitful and good, and right and well-pleasing in the sight of God. And we do that certainly by making sure that singing is a part of it. Singing and singing alone. So thankful for this time. So thankful for our study together. And I appreciate the fact that you've listened. So thankful for this opportunity. Until next time, Lord willing, we'll bid you good day. You've been watching The Ancient Landmark. Tune in weekly on Monday at 9 p.m., Tuesday, 1.30 p.m., Wednesday, 5 p.m., Thursday at 11 p.m., or Friday at 9.30 a.m. Write to The Ancient Landmark, care of Jared Jacobs, 
5695 Caneyville Road, Morgantown, Kentucky, 42261.